Hi, welcome to another virtual program from Maine Historical Society. My name is Kathleen Newman, and it's September 14th, 2023. And this is Bring Back the Pollinators, uh, which we've partnered with the Xerxes Society to bring to you today. And this is part of our series for Code Red, our exhibit on climate, justice, and natural history collections, which is open at MHS Tuesday through Saturday through the end of 2023. Before we begin the program officially, uh, let's just take a moment and remember that Maine Historical Society recognizes that what is currently referred to as Maine is Wabanaki homelands, a place that Wabanaki people have stewarded for over 13,000 years. And wherever we are in Maine, we are on Wabanaki homelands. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations within these lands and waters. Understanding Wabanaki history is vital to understanding Maine, and we're committed uh, to helping provide education about this history through partnerships with Wabanaki people. And Code Red, our exhibit, is a great example of one of those partnerships. Indigenous science, is ex an indigenous artwork, uh, is ex an indigenous history, is explored at great length in that exhibit. And we partnered with Wabanaki people to put that exhibit together. Joining us this evening um, for to talking about, talking about bringing back the pollinators is Lisa Massey, who has been a Xerxes ambassador since 2022 and has been gardening for over 20 years. Although only a small townhouse backyard, her garden supports many pollinators. She has documented 20 butterfly and moth species, almost 20 bee species, including six different bumblebees, and a dozen wasp species, and many more beneficial pollinators. Her garden is a monarch way station certified wildlife habitat and bee-friendly garden, to, to name a few of its distinctions. So, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to be here and to speak to everyone tonight. Uh, on behalf of the Xerxes Society, thank you for inviting me to speak. The Society is named for the now extinct Xerxes Blue Butterfly, the first U.S. butterfly to unfortunately go extinct due to human activities. Since 1971, the Xerxes Society has worked to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. So we pursue our mission in four ways. Uh, conservation, which is hands-on work to transform our landscapes and make them better for wildlife. Um, advocacy, which is standing up, speaking out to protect rare species and the places they live. Uh, we do research, which is expanding knowledge about insects and effective conservation methods and education like this, giving people information and confidence to take their own action. Uh, because of this, Xerxes' work has a lasting impact. Millions of acres of new habitat has been protected, uh, protected from pesticides. Hundreds of thousands of people with more knowledge. Many species are protected at the state or national level. And hundreds of towns and college campuses are taking action as communities to help pollinators. So uh, the Xerxes Society has many partners, over 17,000 members in 15 countries. Scores of private foundations provide funding. More than 100 scientists at universities around the world. Dozens of federal, state, and local agencies. Hundreds of farmers and land managers. Um, more than 50 companies supporting us financially. And then there are the thousands of people who act to protect invertebrates in their own backyards and neighborhoods. So what we're gonna talk about today, this uh, presentation will cover what is pollination? What are the pollinators? Uh, threats to our pollinators and what we can do about it. So pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the stamen, the anther of a flower, to the female pistil or stigma of a flower. Uh, flowers rely on pollination by wind, water, insect, birds, or even bats. A lot of people are surprised that bats are pollinators, but in fact, um, tropical crops like chocolate and bananas are pollinated by bats. 85% of flowering plants require a pollinator to move the pollen and fertilize the flower. And why is this important to us? 
one in three mouthfuls of food or drink that we consume requires pollinators. This is an over $30 billion industry in North America. So this is a picture of Whole Foods Market in their produce section. A few years ago, they wanted to show customers what would happen if we did not have pollinators. So take a good look at the produce section before and after. Whole Foods Market staff took out 237 of the 453 products, a total of 52% of the produce items normally sold at the store. The removed items included apples, avocados, eggplants, and squash. This powerful imagery shows what grocery shopping would look like without pollinators. So we can confidently say that insects do matter. The next year, Whole Foods looked at the impact to dairy. Dairy is affected because cow feed, namely alfalfa, requires pollination. So here is the dairy aisle without pollinators. And as you can see, it's just as empty as the produce section was. In addition to us, pollinators support other wildlife. Many species of fish rely on insects for food. Uh, fruits and seeds make up the majority of many bird diets. Uh, roughly 96% of terrestrial birds in North America rear their young on insects or other arthropods. The most often quoted example of a single species is the Carolina chickadee. As an adult, it eats a lot of seeds and they're regular visitors to our backyard feeders. But insects are the primary food for rearing its young. And a single pair of Carolina chickadees may bring between 390 and 570 caterpillars to their nest every day. The nestlings will be in the nest for about two weeks. So the parents may bring up to 10,000 caterpillars to fledge their brood. You may wonder why there's a bear on this slide, uh, but in the summer, grizzly bears in Yellowstone National Park eat up to 40,000 miller moths every day. A single moth has a high enough fat content that it accounts for as much as half a calorie. So that means that 20,000 calories of just moths per day can be consumed by a rock turning grizzly bear. So in other words, pollinators are very important to us all year long. We'll talk a little bit about pollinator diversity. There are many different kinds of insects that act as pollinators, uh, beetles, butterflies, moths, flies, wasps, and bees. And today we are gonna focus um, our talk on the bees. Bees are the most important group of pollinators. With the exception of a few species of wasps, only bees deliberately gather pollen to bring back to their nests for their offspring. Bees also exhibit a behavior called flower constancy, meaning that they repeatedly visit one particular plant species on any given foraging trip. So on a single foraging trip, a female bee may visit hundreds of flowers, transferring pollen along the entire way. In contrast, butterflies, moths, flies, wasps, and beetles will visit flowers to feed on the nectar. Uh, and they do not necessarily collect that pollen. Therefore, they come into contact less frequently with the flower's anthers than a bee does. Uh, bees have various ways of carrying pollen back to their nests or hives. Uh, they will ha often have a pollen basket on their rear legs uh, where they have a, uh, you can see in the left-hand picture, a, a mass of pollen, or they carry dry pollen grains on their rear legs, abdomen, or thorax. Honeybees are not native bees. They were brought over from Europe in the 1600s. Honeybees are also social and live in large colonies. And this is very different from our native bees. Almost all of our native bees, except for bumblebees, are solitary. Additionally, only honeybees create an excess of honey. Bumblebees produce just enough honey to keep the colony alive when the weather is bad and to keep them going for a few days. So while honeybees are a very important agricultural species, we're gonna focus on native bees today. Most honeybees are managed like livestock is, with some escaped colonies out in the wild. There were almost 3 million hives in the US in 2022. But luckily, 
with helping native bees, you're also helping the honeybees. So when you see something flying around in your garden, you may wonder, is it a bee, a wasp, or some sort of fly? Some ways to tell bees and wasps apart, uh, bees are often hairier, they will have that pollen carrying structure, and wasps will have few hairs, no pollen carrying structure, and the wings may fold lengthwise. And some people might even say that, you know, wasps uh, look mean. Now, telling the difference between a bee and a fly is actually more difficult. Uh, although on the left here, we have a bee, well, uh, they will have the long elbowed antenna, the eyes on the side of the head, uh, pollen carrying structure on their body and two pairs of wings. Flies will have tiny antenna, large eyes that almost meet on the top of the head. They won't have that pollen carrying structure and they'll have only one pair of wings. But a lot of flies have uh, bee mimicry, right? They look like a bee in order to, uh, to stay safe. In fact, I took a photo uh, in my garden the other day and I thought I was taking a photo of a honeybee and it turned out to be a drone fly. And I didn't notice that until I was looking very closely at the picture uh, very close up. So again, native bees are mostly solitary, they're gentle, and they're very unlikely to sting. Since they're not protecting any nest or a stash of honey, they don't typically sting unless they're provoked. Uh, only social bees, such as honeybees or bumblebees, are likely to sting, and that's usually in defense if their nest is disturbed. So worldwide, there is an, uh, there is an estimated 20,000 species of bees with approximately 3,600 species native to North America, north of Mexico, so Canada and the US. Within New England, there are an estimated 400 bee species, and Maine is home to more than 270 species of native pollinating bees. Individual gardens can expect to see upwards of 20 to 30 species, and since 2020, I have been able to document almost 20 different bees in my own backyard, including six different bumblebee species. The diversity of bees is astonishing. Here we have the largest and smallest species of bees in North America. The largest is commonly known as the valley carpenter bee and can be up to an inch and a quarter long. And the smallest shown here is Perdita minima. This little lost bee can turn around comfortably inside a lowercase o in standard font. Both of these bees can be found in California. Bees come in a range of colors from dull black to bright metallic green or blue. They may have markings in red, orange, white, black, brown, or yellow. Some bees don't even look like bees. They're tiny. They're not very fuzzy. They're not yellow and black. Uh, the coin in this photo is a dime to show you for scale uh, the size of this tiny cuckoo bee. As we mentioned before, bees often have a structure for carrying pollen. Some, like honeybees and bumblebees, have a pollen basket on their rear leg, a bare patch of legs surrounded by long, stiff, incurving hairs into which a lump of pollen moistened with nectar is packed. But most bees have a pollen brush like in this photo, that carries dry pollen get, that gets stuck to the feather-like bristles. This longhorn bee has an obvious brush on its rear leg. Leafcutter bees and other big-mouthed bees, the megachilis, have a pollen brush on the underside of their abdomen. A bee has five eyes, two large compound eyes that are used for vision, much like our own, they can see most of the light spectrum that we can, plus UV colors. On top of a bee's head are three small, simple eyes called ocelli that detect light and dark. This tropical bee has enormous ocelli because it's active at night, needs to see in the dark. Different species of bees have tongues of different lengths. A long tongue of this bumblebee allows it to reach nectar inside deep tubular flowers. Some bees with short tongues can only reach the nectar in a shallow or flat flower. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the bee life cycles. So this is an example of what a typical, typical solitary life cycle looks like. Over 90% of native bees are solitary and they generally live for about a year. 
The adult stage typically lasts three to four weeks. The offspring typically remain in the nest for about 11 months, growing through egg, larva, and pupa. A female will mate once and then spend her time creating and provisioning a nest to lay her eggs. The nest may have one to 10 cells, depending on the species. And the cells can be formed or lined with wax or cellophane-like secretions. Sometimes they'll use a piece of leaf or petal or soil or chewed up wood. So before she closes off each cell, the bee will provision it with food for her offspring. She mixes the nectar and the pollen to form a loaf. We call it bee bread inside the brood cell. Then she'll lay an egg in the cell, usually on the loaf, and seals up the cell. When she's completed and sealed all the cells in her nest, the bee will cap the nest entrance and leave. A female solitary bee may lay up to 20 to 30 eggs in her life. Eggs will resemble little white sausages. Uh, one to three weeks later, the eggs hatch and they will a grub-like larva will emerge. It'll feed on the bee bread. It'll grow rapidly for six to eight weeks before changing into a pupa. Uh, during the dormant pupal stage, which could be eight or nine months, the bee transforms within a protective cocoon into its adult form. When it emerges, the adult bee is fully grown, ready to mate and continue this cycle. So roughly 70% of our native bee species nest underground. These will resemble an anthill from above ground. You may find them in turf or more often on bare exposed ground. Sandy to loam soils are preferred, but some will nest in clay. And you can often find them on south facing slopes. You can promote ground nesting sites by leaving some areas undisturbed with patches of bare soil. As a gardener, I use a lot of mulch in my garden, but since I've learned about the bees, I'm starting to leave some bare patches as well, right? I used to be mulch, mulch, mulch around all my plants, but now I do leave those bare patches for the bees. And the other 30% of our native bees nest as solitary individuals in wood tunnels, usually hollow stems or abandoned beetle holes found in dead trees or stumps. Uh, different bee species need different materials to construct their brood cells and seal off their nests, including pieces of leaves, uh, petals, mud, fine pebbles, sawdust, or tree resin. The photo on the left shows a piece of my honeysuckle vine leaf that has been taken by a leaf cutter bee. The photo on the right shows a leaf cutter bee flying around with a curled up piece of the leaf that they have cut out. Bumblebees are social, but they're also ground nesters. Unlike honeybees, which exist in perennial colonies, bumblebees form annual colonies formed in the spring by a solitary queen. The queen creates the first few brood cells from wax and then provisions them with pollen and nectar and lays eggs. It'll take four to five weeks for the first eggs she lays to emerge as adult bees. These bees become her workers, taking on the tasks of foraging and helping the queen tend to the growing number of brood cells. Depending on their role in the nest, workers may live for one to two months, by which time there will be more workers to replace them. The queen continues to lay eggs and the colony will grow steadily through the summer. At the end of the summer, which is what's going on in our gardens right now, the new queens and drones will emerge and mate. Uh, because bumblebees have an annual life cycle, they general, generally only occupy the nest site for one year. Uh, repeated use of the same nest site would happen only by chance, as overwintering queens do not spend the summer in the nest where they were born. Because of this, we encourage folks that find nest sites near their home to try to make space for those bumblebees during that season, rather than attempt to move or exterminate them. Understanding the life cycle of a bumblebee colony is the first step in understanding their unique habitat needs. Uh, as we mentioned, bumblebees need a cavity in which to build their nest. The queens are opportunists, so they'll look for any suitable sized cavity. Sometimes it's above ground, such as a hollow tree, abandoned bird nest, rock walls, under a tussock of grass, but they mostly nest underground. An abandoned rodent hole is a favorite as this space is warm and already lined with fur. Um, it's important to provide blooms throughout the season and native plants where possible. We will go into more detail on native plants in later slides. Uh, this photo is a brown belted bumblebee gathering pollen from an Ohio buckeye tree. I photographed it in a local park in May of this year. 
and, and I had it verified by bumblebeewatch.org, which is a wonderful community science program provided by Xerces. Queen bees are active late April and May, while worker bees and male bumblebees are active June through September. So with queens awakening in April and May, it is very important to have early spring blooms as well as summer blooms in our gardens. Now we'll talk a little bit about the threats to our pollinators. Habitat loss is a key driver of pollinator declines and it can take several forms. One component of loss of habitat is conversion. For example, development, intensive agriculture, especially monoculture, or landscaping that is not pollinator friendly. Another part is pesticide contamination of areas that could otherwise be pollinator habitat. And third factor in habitat loss is the declines of key plant species that pollinators depend on, such as the decline in milkweed that monarchs need to reproduce. So this slide shows examples of common urban areas where pollinator habitat has been lost. This is often overlooked as habitat loss um, because you know people don't realize that having a uh, monoculture lawn is a habitat loss, but really it is. There's, there's nothing going on there. There's nothing in either of these photos uh, that the pollinators can use. Uh, pesticides is also a very big threat. Uh, pesticide is an umbrella term for insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, as well as rodenticides and even antimicrobial products. Um, the pesticides we are most concerned about for our pollinators are insecticides, which kill insects, fungicides, which kill fungi, and herbicides, which kill plants. This is a very major threat to our pollinators. This photo shows sample jars with dead bees. During pollinator week in 2013, near Portland, Oregon, there was an incident. Some trees in a parking lot were treated with insecticides to control aphids. The pesticides got through the sap, into the flowers, and killed approximately 50,000 bumblebees over the period of two weeks. These samples were taken and it proved that it was in fact the pesticide that was used. And the pesticide was applied legally, so it really wasn't anyone's fault. But this underlines that pesticides should be avoided. And the good news is that the pesticides that killed these bees can no longer be used in Portland. When we talk about pesticides, we often think about agricultural areas, crop dusting, but they are also commonly used in urban areas as well. In our communities, pesticides are often used for cosmetic reasons to maintain manicured landscapes. Eliminating this cosmetic pesticide use is a simple step to ensure a healthier environment for pollinators and other species. Another concern with the urban pesticide use is that all of the impervious surfaces like concrete and asphalt allow pesticides to wash off and easily find their way into storm drains and waterways. So limiting urban pesticides is a great step for water quality. Now we'll talk a little bit about conservation. Providing habitat can make a difference for our pollinators. So what all of our pollinators need are essentially nesting sites, flowers for nectar and pollen, and a pesticide-free environment. That's really all they need. So natural areas are obviously the best source of habitat for pollinators, right? Maybe it's uh, out in the fields, roadsides. But even partial habitats are beneficial. It can be a green roof, a bioswale, schoolyards, parks, utility corridors, uh, dead trees and snags, and of course our own gardens. One thing to mention as we talk about conservation activities is that beekeeping should not be confused with bee conservation. Conservation is providing habitat and avoiding the use of pesticides. Keeping honeybee hives is similar to keeping livestock. So as an analogy, to save the songbirds, you don't keep chickens. So as we mentioned earlier, um, honeybees are great for agriculture, but really we do need to, to focus some of our conservation activities on our native bees. Bees don't need a large area of habitat. Even one plant can provide habitat. They also don't need nesting and foraging areas to be right next to each other. 
So think about what your neighbors have in their yard and what uh, do you have any large trees close by? What's near your sidewalk? Perhaps you have a bioswell. The dotted line in this picture is where a bee might travel. It will see flower gardens in this neighborhood, vegetable gardens, fruit trees, and there might even be flowers on the median or curb or boulevard. My city has a wonderful program called Blooming Boulevards that provides native plants specifically for that city-owned boulevard at the end of the driveway, the one that's in between the street and the sidewalk. As we mentioned, uh, bees also need good nesting sites. So some bare ground, hollow tunnels, dead trees. Keep these features in your landscape if you can. Uh, it doesn't have to be tidy. Ground nest areas don't need to be large. This picture shows an area of about eight to 10 inches wide between a rocky wall and a driveway. There are holes under the rock leading to nests, and this is great habitat in a small area. You can also, um, you can also purchase nesting blocks for bees. Uh, they're easy to make yourself, actually. Anything uh, easy to provide, anything with a tunnel hole. You can drill holes in a wooden block or use bamboo. You can purchase, pre purchase uh, nest blocks or bundles of tubes or stems. They should be mounted in a location that receives morning sun but has some protection from the extreme midday summer heat. Generally, the nest entrances should face southeast so that the bees can be warmed as quickly as possible in the morning. Uh, nests should also be erected at least four feet above the ground to raise them above the cool, moist air that might pool at night. And they should be fastened securely so that they don't move in the wind. Now, if you do uh, go this route and, um, and build or buy a nest blocks, remember that they need to be cleaned out every season to prevent the spread of disease. So mason bees will have mud at the end of the block. Leaf cutter bees, you'll often see uh, leaves at the end. And sometimes with these nesting blocks, you'll see grass sticking out. This is because it's being used by a grass carrying wasp. It's not a threat to people. They are gentle, solitary wasps. Uh, they'll even prey on some of the pests in your yard. The little inset photo is a photo of a Mexican grass carrying wasp, which was on my upland white goldenrod in my garden this year. Some people have tried providing boxes for bumblebees. Uh, these ones we're showing are about eight inches by eight inches. You put in some soft beddings with a pipe for the entrance. You can bury it if you want. Um, however, we found that often only one out of every five will ever be occupied. The best way to help bumblebees is to have untidy areas and old rodent holes, leave them alone and the, the bees can use them next year. Uh, again, mentioned that it's very important to provide habitat for diversity of different bees with different emergence times and flight periods. Social bees like bumblebees need consistent source of food throughout the season for the colony to build. Having something in bloom consistently from very early spring until the fall is critical to support pollinator abundance and diversity. Locally native plants are even better. Um, a phrase that I like, I heard it in a webinar and I like to use it is, we need to have landscaping with purpose. So these two photos are from my backyard, a bumblebee on great blue lobelia and a wasp on purple milkweed. And both of these plants are native to Maine. Diversity of flowers is good for a diversity of pollinators. You aim to provide what we like to call an ongoing pollinator buffet. So for a continuous succession of blooms, uh, you can plant what we call a three by three by three garden, meaning a minimum of three plants of three different species of flowers blooming through at least three seasons from early spring to late fall. So besides attracting pollinators and encouraging biodiversity in gardens, many native plants are drought and heat resistant, perfect for urban gardens. With climate change, drought tolerance is very important. Within a landscape context, uh, even small spaces can still make a difference. Think about the habitat around you, even your local parks. How can you fill in the blooming gaps? If you were a, ble if you were a bee flying around, what would you need? 
the photo on this slide is a uh, mega chili leaf cutter bee on my butterfly weed, which is again native to Maine. So we've mentioned that it's important for pollinator habitat contain a diversity of native plants and provide a succession of blooms throughout the growing season. So what I've done here is I've collected photos uh, from left to right, left being spring, summer in the middle and fall in the winter. The left two uh, photos are blood root and prairie smoke. The center photos are narrow leaf vervain, swamp milkweed, butterfly milkweed, both of those are host plants for the monarch butterflies. And also the white flower in the middle is a pearly everlasting, which is a host plant for American lady butterfly. And the last two photos are very important to have in fall, some blooms in fall right now, a New England aster and goldenrod. We mentioned about uh, native plants having a tight relationship with wildlife. It's formed over many thousands of years. Uh, native plants provide natural sources of food, cover, and places to raise their young. Without healthy native plant communities, wildlife cannot survive. The best part about keystone plants is that they feed both specialist and generalist insects. So we'll talk a little bit about keystone native plants. Every ecoregion in North America has different plant communities. Uh, in Maine, there are two ecoregions. The eastern and coastal Maine is ecoregion 8, which is eastern temperate forests, and western Maine is ecoregion 5, northern forests. And then uh, as far as keystone plants go, uh, keystone plants are important because they host their host plants that feed the young caterpillars of approximately 90% of butterflies and moths. And they're also plants that feed specialist bees who can only eat pollen from specific plants. So within the main area, both ecoregions, uh, some examples of keystone trees are oak trees, plum trees, and birch trees. Examples of keystone shrubs are things like blueberry and willow. And uh, some examples of keystone perennials uh, in Maine are uh, goldenrod, asters, and native sunflowers. Uh, a statistic to, to uh, drive home how important keystone plants are, a North American oak tree in its native range will host over 500 species of caterpillars. Whereas an Asian ginkgo tree in North America, as lovely as it is, will host only five species of caterpillars. So that just goes to show you how important our keystone plants are. Uh, again, native plants have evolved in our region and are adapted to our climate. They thrive with minimal maintenance and require significantly less irrigation than non-native plants. Uh, over 90% of herbivore insects are specialists and rely on specific native plants for food. They cannot reproduce without them. So the photos here are um, bumblebee on some hairy beard tongue and a monarch on uh, my swamp milkweed. Both of these plants are native to Maine. You will notice a lot of milkweed photos from my garden. It's one of my favorite plants. Uh, it's also part of my monarch way station. I currently have seven different species um, of uh, Asclepius of milkweed in my garden. And there are at least five species of milkweed that are native to Maine. So the cultivar conundrum. If you're in the garden store, uh, you might see cultivars of our native plants. So if you do buy cultivars, try to stay close to the characteristics of the straight species natives, such as similar colors. Some cultivars are bred simply to be shorter or more resistant to powdery mildew than the native species. So I do have some cultivars of native plants in my garden. These photos show that the cultivars are still attractive to the pollinators. The top photo is a sweat, uh, sweat bee on a um, uh, lilac blue aster, which is a cultivar of New England aster. And uh, I do love this bottom photo. It shows a monarch, a bumblebee, and a banded longhorn beetle all on my white swamp milkweed. 
Uh, native swamp milkweed is pink, but this is a cultivar that is white. Uh, and then have you ever noticed little segments cut out of your plant leaves? And if you should find this, don't worry. Usually it will not cost any, uh, cause any lasting harm to your plants. And so please don't spray your plants with pesticides. Leaf cutter bees cut away segments of leaf in a very neat circular fashion. And upon locating a suitable cavity for nesting, females begin gathering segments of leaves, which are overlapped and form a series of individual cells. As uh, this photo is a leaf cutter hole on my honeysuckle vine. It's also to, uh, important to remember when things are eating the leaves in your garden that these are host plants for our pollinators. So in the center column, um, we talk a little bit about Baptisia, uh, false blue indigo, Baptisia australis, which is a host plant for many butterflies, including the wild indigo duskywing, hoary edge skipper, eastern tail blue, frosted elfin, orange sulfur, and clouded sulfur. So the photo in the center column is of a wild indigo dusky wing. And also I did this year find that uh, one had deposited eggs on my false blue indigo. So that lower picture is a picture of the wild indigo dusky wing egg. Uh, there are two broods every year and fully grown caterpillars from the second uh, brood will hibernate. So I have to be very careful um, I leave my plants up all winter long and I don't cut them down until the spring when it's warm enough and the insects have had a chance to to wake up if they're hibernating in my garden. And again, the last column is the eastern tailed blue, which has three broods every year from April to November in the north. Uh, the females lay eggs on the flower buds, the caterpillars eat the buds, flowers and the seeds. Uh, the caterpillars hibernate and pupating the, then pupate the following spring. So as we mentioned before, pesticides are a huge issue. We have other webinars specifically about pesticides on our YouTube channel. But if you must use them, please minimize their use and read and follow the instructions carefully. Plants are often treated at the nursery with systemic insecticides such as neonicotinoids, um, some neonics will remain on a plant for months or years. So when you go to a nursery, please ask them if the plants have been treated. If they don't know, think twice about buying their plants. A diversity of plants and untidy areas in your yard will also bring in beneficial insects. This photo is of a seven spotted ladybug enjoying a buffet of oleander aphids uh, that are on my world milkweed. We talk a little bit about lawns. Uh, you don't need to have an eco lawn or a blooming boulevard, but perhaps leaving some weeds in your lawn, such as clover, are great for bees, especially early in the season. No Mo May is a conservation initiative first popularized by Plant Life, an organization based in the United Kingdom, but it's gaining traction across North America. The No Mow May movement is spread rapidly, and it's a great way to change how our lawns are managed to make them better for bees. This is particularly important in urban areas where floral resources are often limited, and it's just one part of making our landscapes more sustainable. And while monarch migration is a well-known phenomenon, it's not the norm when it comes to butterflies. In fact, the vast majority of butterflies and moths overwinter in the landscape as either eggs, caterpillars, chrysalis, or adult. In all but the warmest climates, these butterflies use leaf litter for their winter cover. Woolly bear caterpillars tuck themselves into a pile of leaves for protection from cold weather and predators. Red banded hair streaks lay their eggs on fallen oak leaves, which become the first food of the caterpillars when they emerge. Luna moths and swallowtail butterflies disguise their cocoons and chrysalises as dried leaves, blending in with the real leaves. These are just many examples. So Bring Back the Pollinators is a Xerces campaign. You can sign up today. There are four principles to this campaign, uh, pro providing a pollinator friendly flowers, providing habitat for nests and egg laying, going pesticide free in your garden and spreading the word. 
Because once you've done all these wonderful things for pollinators in your garden, you should place a sign or many signs in your garden. This will help your neighbors to understand what you're doing. This particular sign in the slide can be purchased online, or you can even create your own sign. And if you want to go beyond your garden and get your city to be a bee city, you can visit our website for more information, Bee City USA. You can also get involved in all sorts of community science projects. We mentioned earlier Bumblebee Watch, which is run through the Xerces Society. I use it all the time. I've been using it for years. You upload photos of the bumblebees that you find in your garden. And um, the website will help you walk through to try to figure out what species of bumblebee it is. And then an expert will actually tell you whether you're correct or not. They will they will verify what bumblebee you have, uh, what bumblebee is in the photo you have submitted. Uh, as well, iNaturalist is uh, a great way to to both track, but also learn about the all sorts of flora and fauna that are in your backyards. And also a really popular one, uh, especially right now for the monarch migration is Journey North. So Journey North is a great citizen science community where you can log photos of any monarchs or hummingbirds that you have throughout the season so that we can see um, when uh, the migration is occurring and where our monarchs and hummingbirds are. Uh, Xerces also has a wonderful program called X Kids. Uh, it targets elementary school age children, grades three to five. It's available in both English and Spanish. And there is a lot of information at xerces.org. Uh, forward slash x kids if you're interested in that or if you have any teachers in your family that you want to pass that information to and um, as I mentioned before uh, we have a Xerxes has written a number of wonderful books uh, all, all of these books can be found for sale on Amazon uh, in fact I I owned many of these books uh, especially the you know 100 uh, flowers to feed the bees and 100 flowers to feed the monarchs I owned those way before I even became involved in Xerxes but it was one of the, the ways that I learned about Xerxes they're fantastic resources and as well, uh, there are a lot of free resources on the website. Lots of things, there are reports, uh, there are uh, fact sheets and brochures, lots of things that can be downloaded from Xerces. And when you are, if you are on the Xerces website and you're looking for information, uh, look for the Northeast region. Xerces has done a great job of breaking up North America into all the different regions so that when you go to their website and you're doing a search in the Northeast region of, the, of their website, you will get all of the resources that are applicable to New England and Maine. Uh, you can follow us on social media. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, Instagram, and also YouTube. Um, Xerces have so many wonderful webinars available on YouTube. Um, one of the things we do when we start off as ambassadors is they give us a list of about a dozen webinars to watch. Uh, I watched them all. They were fantastic. I kept watching. I watched even more webinars than I needed to when I uh, joined and started becoming a, an ambassador. So there's a wealth of knowledge. This year I was focusing on uh, on fireflies and watching all the webinars on fireflies so I could learn about those. Um, and so just a lot of really great information on the Xerces uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we're a donor supported nonprofit. So you could always consider becoming a member or making a donation today. It's all available on our website. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I know I've given you a lot of information. Uh, hopefully there's a, a, a couple of uh, questions out there for, for me, but this has been just fantastic to, uh, to be able to give you all this information about our pollinators and how to help our pollinators. Thank you, Lisa. That was that was great. Really interesting and informative. Um, one question from our audience. This is a great question. Where do bees and butterflies go when it rains? We've had so much rain this spring. Um, and this uh, 
audience members saying that they haven't seen as many monarchs this year and that the weather's just been tough on plants in general. So where are they? Yes, there's been a lot of talk. Uh, specifically, I'll talk a little bit about the monarchs. As you can see from my background, they're a favorite of mine. Um, but there was a lot of questions as to where did the monarchs go this year? We had hardly any where I live. But um, what we've sort of been determining um, is that there were a lot of forest fires. And there were forest fires up in northern Ontario and Quebec. And so a lot of monarch, a lot of monarchs ended up in Manitoba and Ontario, but way west of where they normally would be. And so I think what the thinking is that with the forest fires and a lot of smoke in the air, the the monarchs went all the way up to their northern um you know northern summer homes so to speak where they usually go in the summer but not through the regular routes that they normally oh, okay. uh, because we had a lot of smoke here in Ontario in June which is when I would have normally seen monarchs I didn't get any in my backyard until July so they were very late there were fewer of them but we hear through journey north that there were tons of monarchs up in Sudbury so uh, Ontario. So mm -hmm. again, they all got there. They just took a different path. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, the good news is they all got there. <laughs> they just didn't go just through didn't our backyards that <laughs> we might've been used to seeing them. Um, but, and also where do they go? They, they, uh, during rainstorms and whatnot, they go under leaves, they go under, under flowers. Um, I took a great picture. I should add it to this presentation. The other day, some of my asters have opened and I went out in the morning and there were a number of bumblebees and you can tell because they're not getting the pollen, they're hanging underneath the aster because it's protecting them oh. and um, it's keeping the rain off of them. So I should, I need to go out there and take a few more pictures of these. Sometimes I find them sleeping underneath. And then when in the morning, when it gets warm enough, they'll start to get active again. They'll crawl up to the top of the flower and go after the nectar. But it is quite adorable to see them <laughs> underneath the petals and underneath the leaves. But that's where that's where they hide out. And what is, can you clarify for me, a monarch way station, so like a butterfly rest stop, like on their journey? Yes. <laughs> okay. So basically monarch way stations, um, they have to have a certain amount of milkweed in them. So that's one of the criteria because um, milkweed, now mind you, milkweed, there are, you know, dozens upon dozens of species of milkweeds that the monarchs will use. So it's important to find ones that are native to your area. So in order to be a monarch way station, they want you to have milkweed so that the monarchs will lay eggs in your backyard. And I, the the one or two monarchs that came through in July, egg bombed my backyard. It was wow. wonderful to wonderful to see. Uh, but also, in addition to having milkweed in your garden, you have to have nectar plants and a certain number of nectar plants because the adult butterflies. Uh, no longer eat the leaves or the stems, they want the nectar that's in it. So as long as you have both nectar plants and milkweed, you can apply to become a monarch way station. And you get a nice little sign and it's great. It sort of show, shows your neighbors what you're, you're doing. You're official. <laughs> yes. Now you mentioned something interesting when, when the talk began that the Xerxes Society is named after a species of butterfly, mm -hmm. the first to go extinct because of human Yes. activity can you tell us like a little more about that like when did that happen why did that happen yes so it, it turns out and of course you you know you don't realize until the damage has been done but it turns out that the Xerxes blue um their the area that they preferred in California was right along the coast and I believe it was just outside of the San Francisco area and so as San Francisco was developing, I believe the last time that butterfly was seen was, I think 1927, I could have that wrong, but somewhere around in the 20s. And so, you know, you have a butterfly that was abundant in the 1800s, abundant in the early 1900s, and then as California 
is developed, mm. all of the land where those plants would have been um, is is taken over for mm -hmm. you know uh, the cities and towns, mm -hmm. and then suddenly a butterfly is no longer found. Mm. There's there's a similar situation going on over on our coast on the east coast with the Kerner blue butterfly. So again, a lovely little blue butterfly. Its only host plant is native lupins, oh. and I think what a lot of people grow are cultivar lupins mm. um and the butterfly will not eat those oh. so what we've done is we've brought in all these beautiful flowers that the butterfly knows the difference between the native lupin and the uh, cultivar it won't eat the cultivar and it's dwindling down to being almost extinct so there's a real push where i live mm. for people to start planting the native lupins um, rather than the beautiful bright purple ones that are all the rage right now that you can pick up in so any fun. nursery, right? So I, I think because, you know, un until until you realize, oh, wow, this, this butterfly won't go on the cultivars, that's when you start to realize the damage that, that we're doing. So that's when we say yeah. that it's, it's damage that is caused by humans' mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, this, again, really informative, really interesting stuff. Um, I feel like I'm gathering a lot of good ideas for for, for planting uh, a nice garden next year. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us this evening. So the website is uh, it's xerces.org. Yes. I've shared in the chat. Perfect. And um, if you want to learn more, too, about specifically about pollinators and plants, um, but and butterflies in Maine, uh, be sure to come see Code Red at Maine Historical Society. So visit uh, mainehistory.org and you can learn more about uh, the exhibit. You can buy your tickets there and you can also, you'll be able to see um, not only this program, but recordings of our other uh, Code Red programs. Uh, Lisa, was there anything else that you wanted to add before we close? No, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's always great just to talk to people about our pollinators. And uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that I gave you some ideas for your garden. That makes yes. me very happy. Thank <laughs> you. It was our pleasure. And uh, thanks very much. And, and good luck with all the work that uh, you and the other good folks at Xerces do. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Okay. Have a good night, everyone.